Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of Encounter with God Together. This is our weekly audio and video podcast where we review the readings in our daily Bible reading guide called Encounter with God. And you can see there on the screen that um, if, for those of you who are watching, that we are entering a new quarter of our Bible guide. And uh, we're starting with October, November, December, heading into the end of 2024. Really hard to believe, isn't it, Whitney? It sure is. It's going fast. It's going fast. And each quarter, I like to have our President Emeritus Whitney Cunningham come on and give a little bit of an overview. And uh, I think this will be a good one as he himself is one of the writers in this issue. That's right. That's right. It was a long time ago that I that I wrote these notes by the time it makes it through the whole process and comes up. So for me, it even feels a little fresh, too. Yeah, that's great. Well, let me, let me pray for you as you get ready to share. Okay. Father, I do pray for Whitney. I thank you for the way that he uh, engages you, engages your word, and shares it with others. And I pray that you will speak through him tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, yeah, so kick us off with the new quarter. Yeah, well, it's a new quarter. It's the fourth quarter. And, uh, you know, right now in our notes, uh, we're getting the baton pass from Elijah to Elisha. And so we're just doing that. So at the beginning of the quarter, we'll finish that up. But then we'll go through Ecclesiastes, Mark, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, uh, Matthew, and Habakkuk, which is a lot of ground, a lot of ground to cover yes. in one quarter. And if that's not if that's not all, there is right in the middle, there's this big chunk. We're going to do Isaiah chapters 22 to 39, which is the set of notes that I wrote. And I just like to reflect on that because it's sort of at the heart of our quarter. And I think there's some themes that are very relevant for us today. So if it's okay, I think I'll just make a few comments on that to kind of set that up because I think that's the longest set of readings that we have. It's sort of the, you know, Isaiah is probably is the the longest of the of the prophets. Uh, I believe it's the most quoted in the New Testament. So it's kind of the big one. And yeah. it's the big one for our quarter. So we'll reflect on that a little bit here. That sounds great. And, uh, you know, if you, if, you know, in kind of with God readers, they're familiar with um, Isaiah because, <clears throat> you know, mostly because of the beginning, right? Because the the vision that Isaiah had in the temple and his calling and the overwhelming glory of God and how it just kind of blew him away. And we're, we're reminded of, you know, how when we truly have an encounter with God, a real encounter with God, what it does is it brings us to our knees. It reminds us of our own sinfulness. Oh. That's what you see. A real encounter with God uh, makes you realize how holy God is and how far away from that it, we are, and yet how wonderful his grace is to accept us and love us as we do. That's the part we're familiar with. Well, the readings that we're going to go through this quarter in Isaiah are the less familiar parts of Isaiah. Ooh. There's a lot of um, um, amazingly contemporary themes in there because um, Isaiah is living, he lived for a long time, and he's living through a whole time of geopolitical pressure. Um, and you can't read the news today without realizing we're in a very similar time. I mean, the Middle East is boiling over even as we speak, and all of us need to be praying for peace in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. but, um, but he was facing it. And so it, it tells us how does a person who loves God, who follows God, who wants to encounter with encounter God, how do we live in this environment where uh, the pol the political, the military, the geo uh, circumstances all feel like they're about to boil over. That's what Hezekiah is. And what's great is, you know, in the first part of the readings, we get these oracles, these prophetic oracles to the nations. And you know what? We'll find them hard to follow. They are kind of hard to follow, kind of odd names and odd places. And then they zero in on Jerusalem. It gets a little bit clearer, but sometimes exactly what's going on in the prophetic messages, it's hard to follow. But the good news is from chapters 36 to 39, it almost, it, it becomes a narrative. 
and it's mm. the Hezekiah narrative, King Hezekiah. And so what we what we get is a personal picture of how one individual deals with, responds to these pressures. Mm. And that's what I think makes this really relevant. Not only is it relevant, uh, the themes that we're experiencing in the world today, but also um, the pressures that we face as as encounter with God people. Mm. And so um, there's a there's actually two um, very famous uh, uh, accounts in the Hezekiah narrative that we're going to run into. And the first one, I would say, helps us get a picture of how to deal with external pressure. External pressure. We all have things outside of us, things at our work, things at church, things, you know, external to us that are pressuring us and keeping us awake at night. And for uh, for King Hezekiah, it was a letter from the king of Assyria, and it was also his field commander that basically were defying, you know, uh, Hezekiah and challenging him, saying, we're going to take you down, don't even try, all of that stuff. And uh, what does Hezekiah do? The famous thing he does is he spreads the letter before the Lord and just prays. And I think there's a model for us, what your external pressure is. Mm. You know, um, have you ever taken a symbol of what that external pressure is? The stack of bills, you know, the letter from the attorney, the whatever it is, to put it before the Lord and say, I don't know what to do. But Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, you and you alone are sovereign. And that's who I turn to in this moment. Mm. What we'll see is this picture of how to deal with external pressure. Mm -hmm. Well, the second thing is we see a picture and a model of how to deal with internal pressure, internal pressure. You know, the things that you worry about, you know, the things that... uh, you, 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 your trouble you, you know, that are on your mind, on your heart, you can't make them go away. And uh, Hezekiah is told by God that he's about to die. And what does he do? He prays, he, he humbles himself. And he, the famous uh, prayer where is God responds and gives him 15 more years to live. But it's an example of uh, how do we, re, how do we deal with internal pressure? And again, he throws himself on the Lord. He, he, he just pours himself out and God says, I've heard you. I've heard you because you've just totally uh, trusted me in this. Now, I know a lot of us, me, everybody, you know, many of us uh, listening to this, uh, we have health issues. Mm-hmm. You know, we have internal pressures. We have all, w- whatever it is. But I have found comfort in even taking the words of scripture and making them uh, part of my prayer. Um, just recently, I was reflecting on the, the we were going through Mark. And uh, when Jesus said, uh, after the, he calmed the storm. And he says to them, he, Jesus says to his disciples, why are you so afraid? And what struck me is the tense because he had already calmed the storm. So the sun was out. The wind had died down. He didn't say, why were you so afraid? He said, why are you so afraid? In other words, why do you live in fear? And so I've been praying that. I've got some things that, you know, upset and unsettle me. And I, when I feel that, I say, I, I just pray that out loud. Why are you so afraid? And it reminds me that Jesus, you know, when, when Jesus is there, The outcome may go one way or the other, but there's no need to be afraid. And you see a picture of that in Hezekiah, where um, he throws uh, himself to the Lord in that. Well, you know, there's one other thing, and I wish this wasn't in the readings. I really do. Uh, It's chapter 39. And Hezekiah, after all this gritty determination, throwing himself on the Lord for the external pressures and the internal pressures, he blows it at the end. And uh, he gets a letter from the ki- another letter, a friendly letter, you know. Uh, and he totally you're gonna you'll see how he totally loses it, and uh, just kind of loses all his gritty determination, and and the Lord judges him for it. I wish it wasn't there. It's kind of the sad ending. You wish they would re- redo that part <laughs> of the movie. 
<laughs> That's when you watch a whole series and then you're like, why did I do that? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. What I would say is the Hezekiah narrative is a fascinating narrative. It's an often overlooked part of Isaiah, but there's a lot for us um, in this uh, in this time. And I guess that that sad ending or that un, unsatisfying ending reminds us that there's a danger in the good times. Yeah. You know, when the pressure was on, Hezekiah was laser focused on turning to the Lord. When the pressure was off, he got lazy, spiritually lazy. And that's when he was most vulnerable. And maybe that's the lesson for us. That's when we're we're the most vulnerable as well. So yeah. there's a few uh, points in uh, in uh, Isaiah, and um, and hopefully uh, it will be relevant not only to our wider situation that we see in the world today, but also to the pressures that we face every day. That's great. Thank you so much, Whitney. And you know there are a lot of books that are coming up this quarter, and that just struck me, reminded me of. Um, of a project that I think you're working on to try to make sense of, of the whole of scripture. Do you want to share a little bit about that with, um, with those who are watching and uh, how, how you're thinking about it? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm working on a, a book and I've actually finished the book and it's going to come out in this quarter. So uh, uh, on uh, November one is the plan for it to be released and it's called uh, top 10 Bible stories. Uh, a, a and so what it does is it takes five Old Testament stories, five New Testament stories. And by stories, I mean broad narratives. So the narrative of creation, the narrative of Exodus, um, the life of Jesus, the, you know, the, the birth of the church, things like that, broad narratives. And my premise is if you know these five or five Old Testament, five New Testament, you know these 10 basic narratives, you'll have a good feel for what's in the Bible. Now, why would I do that, Gail? Why would I do you? Because know, you you might say, well, Whitney, you did a essential 100. You know, that's a, a a fast track through the Bible. That's true, but that believe it or not, that was 20 years ago, and I've learned a whole lot about how much people want um, an overview of the Bible because they get it in bits and pieces. Now, if you're an encounter with God reader, you can you can keep all the pieces together, but a lot of people can't. And so what I've I've realized is there's a hunger to see the big picture of the Bible. Um, but what I'm realizing um, is that people, from when I did E100 to now, people today are a lot more hesitant and a lot more skeptical. Mm. So they're curious about the Bible. They want to know the big story of the Bible, but they don't want anybody forcing an agenda on them. So what I've done is wrote, I've written this one for the skeptical mind. Oh, interesting. So for the, yeah. And so, and I actually, I built in something, I call it the no hidden agenda promise. <laughs> so my promise is I'll walk you through the Bible like a friend and I'll point out what it says, but at the end, I'm going to step back and let you make up your own mind about what you believe. And I think that approach is the approach that um, that people today, curious seekers, want to know. And by the way, I think it's it's the approach that people in the church, Bible people, need as well. They want to discover it for themselves. So I'm excited about this. But I'm also excited because, Gail, I know you and I are working in, in uh, we're going to work in partnership to try to get whole churches to do this together. Yeah. And what I've discovered over the years is when groups of people, churches, small groups, when people read the Bible in community, I don't mean a group Bible study, but I mean they're reading and living the Bible together. There's real spiritual power in that. Mm. I've, I've called it over the years Bible reading revival, and I've seen it in church after church. I've, I've seen the the most, you know, the smallest musty basement church come alive when people are reading and living God's word together. And so what I hope is not only will this top 10 Bible stories project um, get people who are hesitant and skeptical about the Bible into the word, but I'm also um, hopeful and prayerful that um, it will, it God will use it 
to create little pockets of Bible reading revival in churches and groups wherever uh, they have it. And I'm, you know what, Gail, I'm looking forward to working with you on this because, uh, you know, uh, just Scripture Union's connection to the church. Um, and we'll just see. Yeah, you know, yeah, we'll- yeah. So uh, keep your eyes peeled out there for, for news about that. And uh, if it's already sparked your curiosity, send us a note, let us know. Uh, we're looking forward to the November, November 1 date. Yep. Great, Whitney. It's great to see you continuing to uh, produce helpful tools uh, to help us see our way through scripture. And uh, thanks for getting us going on this quarter. Yep. I'm looking forward to it. That's great. You want to close us in prayer and maybe uh, I think there's a couple things in the world going on that you, uh, you mentioned. Yes. Uh, and also I'm very mindful of the, of Western North Carolina. A uh, number of our, our donors and supporters live or have houses in that area. Mm-hmm. And uh, just hard to believe what we're seeing on the, on the news. Yep. So, so you give right. a little prayer. That would be great. Yeah, pray together. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that as we do read it and live it together, um, your Holy Spirit works in ways that are wonderful and exciting and powerful. And uh, God, I pray that for this quarter for Encounter with God. And I pray this for all the different ways that uh, Scripture Union is at work, um, rallying people around your word. Also, Father, we're uh, mindful that this is a needy world. So we pray for peace in the Middle East. Lord, it's beyond our abilities to fix or even understand, but it's not beyond you, the maker of heaven and earth. And so we appeal to you, Lord, to bring peace to that troubled part of the world. And we also pray for our brothers and sisters um, that are just dealing with overwhelming amounts of water in uh, North Carolina and in the South and wherever the uh, hurricane has gone. Lord, we pray that you would come to their aid and come to their aid quickly. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Whitney. Look forward to uh, engaging more deeply with your notes in particular. Okay. Have a great week, everyone. Bye for now. Bye, Gail. Bye-bye.